Lesson 1 Crisis of Identity Sabbath Afternoon December 26 The professed people of God had separated from God and had lost their wisdom and perverted their understanding. They could not see afar off, for they had forgotten that they had been purged from their old sins. They moved restlessly and uncertainly under darkness, seeking to obliterate from their minds the memory of the freedom, assurance, and happiness of their former estate. They plunged into all kinds of presumptuous, foolhardy madness, placed themselves in opposition to the providences of God, and deepened the guilt that was already upon them. They listened to the charges of Satan against the divine character and represented God as devoid of mercy and forgiveness. The prophet writes of them, saying, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Review and Herald, August 6, 1895. The work of restoration can never be thorough unless the roots of evil are reached. Again and again the shoots have been clipped, while the root of bitterness has been left to spring up and defile many. But the very depth of the hidden evil must be reached, the moral senses must be judged, and judged again, in the light of the Divine Presence. The daily life will testify whether or not the work is genuine. This is the work before every soul who has dishonored God and grieved the heart of Christ by a denial of truth and righteousness. If the tempted soul endures the trying process and self does not awake to life to feel hurt and abused under the test, that probing knife reveals that the soul is indeed dead to self, but alive unto God. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1152. The government of God is not, as Satan would make it appear, founded upon a blind submission, an unreasoning control. It appeals to the intellect and the conscience. Come now, and let us reason together, is the Creator's invitation to the beings He has made. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. God does not force the will of His creatures. He cannot accept an homage that is not willingly and intelligently given. A mere forced submission would prevent all real development of mind or character. It would make man a mere automation. Such is not the purpose of the Creator. He desires that man, the crowning work of his creative power, shall reach the highest possible development. He sets before us the height of blessing to which he desires to bring us through his grace. He invites us to give ourselves to him that he may work his will in us. It remains for us to choose whether we will be set free from the bondage of sin to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Steps to Christ, pages 43 and 44. Sunday, December 27. Hear, O heavens! It is no light matter to sin against God, to set the perverse will of man in opposition to the will of his Maker. It is for the best interest of men, even in this world, to obey God's commandments. And it is surely for their eternal interest to submit to God and be at peace with Him. Of all the creatures that God has made upon the earth, man alone is rebellious. Yet he possesses reasoning powers to understand the claims of the divine law and a conscience to feel the guilt of transgression and the peace and joy of obedience. God made him a free moral agent to obey, or disobey. The reward of everlasting life and eternal weight of glory is promised to those who do God's will, while the threatenings of His wrath hang over all who defy His law. The Sanctified Life, page 76. The history of the past shows an active working devil. He can no more be idle than harmless. Satan was found in only one tree to endanger the safety of Adam and Eve, he planned to attract the holy pair to that one tree that they might do the very thing God had said they should not do, eat of the tree of knowledge. There was no danger to them in approaching any other tree. How plausible his speech! He laid hold of the very arguments which he uses today, flattery, envy, 
distrust, questioning, and unbelief. If Satan was so cunning at first, what must he be now after gaining an experience of many thousands of years? Yet God and holy angels and all those who abide in obedience to all the Lord's expressed will are wiser than he. The subtlety of Satan will not decrease, but the wisdom given to men through a living connection with the source of all light and divine knowledge will be proportionate to his arts and wiles. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 504. Behold the world today in open rebellion against God. This is in truth a froward generation filled with ingratitude, formalism, insincerity, pride, and apostasy. Men neglect the Bible and hate truth. Jesus sees his law rejected, his love despised, his ambassadors treated with indifference. He has spoken by his mercies, but these have been unacknowledged. He has spoken by warnings, but these have been unheeded. The temple courts of the human soul have been turned into places of unholy traffic. Selfishness, envy, pride, malice, all are cherished. Many do not hesitate to sneer at the word of God. Those who believe that word just as it reads are held up to ridicule. There is a growing contempt for law and order, directly traceable to a violation of the plain commands of Jehovah. Violence and crime are the result of turning aside from the path of obedience. Behold the wretchedness and misery of multitudes who worship at the shrine of idols and who seek in vain for happiness and peace. Prophets and Kings, page 185 Monday, December 28 Rotten Ritualism The Jews had become familiar with the offering of blood and had almost lost sight of the fact that it was sin which made necessary all this shedding of the blood of beasts. They did not discern that it prefigured the blood of God's dear Son, which was to be shed for the life of the world, and that by the offering of sacrifices men were to be directed to a crucified Redeemer. In place of humble repentance of sin, they had multiplied the sacrifice of beasts as if God could be honored by a heartless service. The priests and rulers had hardened their hearts through selfishness and avarice. The very symbols pointing to the Lamb of God, they had made a means of getting gain. Thus, in the eyes of the people, the sacredness of the sacrificial service had been in a great measure destroyed. The indignation of Jesus was stirred. He knew that his blood, so soon to be shed for the sins of the world, would be as little appreciated by the priests and elders as was the blood of beasts which they kept incessantly flowing. The Desire of Ages, pages 589 and 590. Confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance and reformation. There must be decided changes in the life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. This will be the result of genuine sorrow for sin. The work that we have to do on our part is plainly set before us. Wash you, make you clean, Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 15. Paul says, speaking of the work of repentance, Ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you! Yea, what clearing of yourselves! Yea, what indignation! Yea, what fear! Yea, what vehement desire! Yea, what zeal! Yea, what revenge! In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. When sin has deadened the moral perceptions, the wrongdoer does not discern the defects of his character nor realize the enormity of the evil he has committed, and unless he yields to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, he remains in partial blindness to his sin. His confessions are not sincere and in earnest. 
To every acknowledgment of his guilt, he adds an apology and excuse of his course, declaring that if it had not been for certain circumstances, he would not have done this or that for which he is reproved. Steps to Christ, pages 39 and 40. Tuesday, December 29. The Argument of Forgiveness. Whom Christ pardons, he first makes penitent, and it is the office of the Holy Spirit to convince of sin. Those whose hearts have been moved by the convicting Spirit of God see that there is nothing good in themselves. They see that all they have ever done is mingled with self and sin. Like the poor publican, they stand afar off, not daring to lift up so much as their eyes to heaven and cry, God be merciful to me the sinner. Luke chapter 18 verse 13, Revised Version, Margin. And they are blessed. There is forgiveness for the penitent, for Christ is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. God's promise is, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 7 and 8. The Lord God through Christ holds out His hand all the day long in invitations to the needy. He will receive all. He welcomes all. He rejects none. It is His glory to pardon the chief of sinners. He will take the prey from the mighty. He will deliver the captive. He will pluck the brand from the burning. He will lower the golden chain of His mercy to the greatest depths of human wretchedness and guilt and lift up the debased soul contaminated with sin. But man must will to come and cooperate in the work of saving his soul by availing himself of opportunities given him of God. The Lord forces no one. The spotless wedding robe of Christ's righteousness is prepared to clothe the sinner, but if he refuses it, he must perish. That I may know him. Page 235. Those who are deceived by Satan look upon God as hard and exacting. They regard him as watching to denounce and condemn, as unwilling to receive the sinner so long as there is a legal excuse for not helping him. His law they regard as a restriction upon men's happiness, a burdensome yoke from which they are glad to escape. But he whose eyes have been opened by the love of Christ will behold God as full of compassion. He does not appear as a tyrannical, relentless being, but as a father longing to embrace his repenting son. Christ's Object Lessons, page 204 As the character of the Divine One was manifested to John, he saw his own deficiency and was humbled by the knowledge. The strength and patience, the power and tenderness, the majesty and meekness that he beheld in the daily life of the Son of God filled his soul with admiration and love. Day by day his heart was drawn out toward Christ until he lost sight of self in love for his Master. His resentful, ambitious temper was yielded to the molding power of Christ. The regenerating influence of the Holy Spirit renewed his heart, the power of the love of Christ wrought a transformation of character. This is the sure result of union with Christ. When Christ abides in the heart, the whole nature is transformed. Steps to Christ, page 73 Wednesday, December 30 To eat or be eaten God speaks to His people in blessings bestowed. And when these are not appreciated, he speaks to them in blessings removed, that they may be led to see their sins and return to him with all the heart. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 470. We should keep in our thoughts every blessing we receive from God, and when we realize his great love, we should be willing to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. The soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise, God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above, and as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly hosts. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth God. Psalm 50, verse 23. Let us with reverent joy come before our Creator with thanksgiving and the voice of melody. 
Isaiah chapter 51, verse 3. Steps to Christ, page 104. God has given us the power of choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service. But we can choose to serve God. We can give Him our will. Then He will work in us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. Thus our whole nature will be brought under the control of Christ. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in the life. By yielding up the will to Christ, we ally ourselves with divine power. We receive strength from above to hold us steadfast. A pure and noble life, a life of victory over appetite and lust, is possible to everyone who will unite his weak, wavering human will to the omnipotent, unwavering will of God. The Ministry of Healing, page 176. Those who have genuine love for God will manifest an earnest desire to know His will and to do it. The child who loves his parents will show that love by willing obedience, but the selfish, ungrateful child seeks to do as little as possible for his parents while he at the same time desires to enjoy all the privileges granted to the obedient and faithful. The same difference is seen among those who profess to be children of God. Many who know that they are the objects of His love and care and who desire to receive His blessing take no delight in doing His will. They regard God's claims upon them as an unpleasant restraint, His commandments as a grievous yoke. But he who is truly seeking for holiness of heart and life delights in the law of God and mourns only that he falls so far short of meeting its requirements. Reflecting Christ, page 96. Thursday, December 31. Ominous Love Song. God had planted Israel as a goodly vine by the wells of life. He had made his vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He had fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 2. The people of Christ's day made a greater show of piety than did the Jews of earlier ages, but they were even more destitute of the sweet graces of the Spirit of God. The precious fruits of character were not manifest in the Jewish nation. God and His Son had been seeking fruit and had found none. Israel was a cumberer of the ground. Its very existence was a curse, for it filled the place in the vineyard that a fruitful tree might fill. It robbed the world of the blessings that God designed to give. The Israelites had misrepresented God among the nations. They were not merely useless, but a decided hindrance. To a great degree, their religion was misleading and wrought ruin instead of salvation. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 214 and 215. There is too much self. We want self to die and be hid in Christ Jesus. Then we will not talk of discouragement and difficulties and all these small things, but we will talk of the great plan of redemption and the matchless power of Jesus Christ to come to our world and take upon him human nature that we through him might be elevated and have a seat at his right hand. What could be more pleasant than that? If this is not enough... What more could heaven do for the fallen race than has been done? What more, says Christ, could I do for my sheep than that I have done? What more? Will he have to let us go? He will unless you change your attitude toward God, for he has done all he could to save us. According to the light that we have received, so is our accountability before God. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Lift him up, page 216. Of special value to God's church on earth today, the keepers of His vineyard, are the messages of counsel and admonition given through the prophets who have made plain His eternal purpose in behalf of mankind. In the teachings of the prophets, His love for the lost race and His plan for their salvation are clearly revealed. 
the story of Israel's call, of their successes and failures, of their restoration to divine favor, of their rejection of the master of the vineyard, and of the carrying out of the plan of the ages by a goodly remnant to whom are to be fulfilled all the covenant promises, this has been the theme of God's messengers to His Church throughout the centuries that have passed. Let Israel hope in God. The master of the vineyard is even now gathering from among men of all nations and peoples the precious fruits for which he has long been waiting. Soon he will come unto his own, and in that glad day his eternal purpose for the house of Israel will finally be fulfilled. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Verse 6, Prophets and Kings, page 22. For further reading, in Heavenly Places, Sure Remedy for Sin, page 23, and Testimonies for the Church, A Call for Reformation, volume 8, pages 250 and 251.